also those on the front lines, like our grocers, farm workers, and others that uh, are making sure that our essential needs are met uh, at this very important moment. It's right to pause and reflect and thank each and every one of them. It's also appropriate that we pause and reflect on the economic dislocation uh, that millions and millions of Californians have suffered uh, and the need to do everything in our power to make sure uh, that their immediate needs are attended to uh, and that we move aggressively but thoughtfully and strategically with a health first mindset to reopening the economy at peril of the economic conditions uh, exacerbating. And so I want to just begin today uh, not only to acknowledge uh, those workers, but just to remind you a little bit about what we've been doing for both essential workers and for those that have been displaced. Uh, we talked yesterday about a new portal uh, for child care, uh, but again, you can't talk about the workforce, those needs of essential workers, uh, and those that are active and searching for job opportunities that have been displaced without talking about the need to take care of their children. Uh, some 20,000 vouchers have been set aside uh, in uh, our efforts to address the child care needs uh, of thousands and thousands of critical frontline employees. We also put that site up uh, that identifies over 28,000 slots that are available today. Uh, if you go to that site on covid19.ca.gov, you can just Type in your zip code and you can see uh, a number of licensed facilities in and around your community with available slots and information uh, about health and safety and quality uh, assessments that our team has put together. But child care has been foundational and uh, we've got more work to do in that space. Uh, we'll have more resources to invest in that space coming from the federal government, some $350 million uh, that we'll be working with the legislature uh, to distribute as quickly as we can. Uh, but again, very grateful for the work at the Department of Social Services uh, and their emphasis and focus on child care in this state. Accordingly, we focused on sick leave. Uh, there was a gap with the Federal CARES Act as it relates to sick leave or subsequent acts uh, of Congress uh, as it related to sick leave, uh, protecting uh, smaller employers and employees, which was critical, but we uh, wanted to make sure that those in the food chain, from our farm workers to those that are packing, uh, those that are preparing, those that are distributing, uh, those uh, that are there in the front lines in our grocery stores, uh, larger employers uh, also had sick leave protection, those employees uh, getting that protection. And so that's something else we're very proud we were able to advance an agreement in that space. And uh, again, just want to applaud the Grocers Association working with UFCW, one of the largest, the largest uh, grocers union in the United States, uh, for their outstanding willingness uh, to contribute uh, uh, and put aside uh, their differences and contribute uh, to the needs of these critical employees. We also announced a number, a series of other things that we wanted to do for our frontline health care workers, care for caregivers. You recall a few weeks back we announced efforts uh, to provide stipends uh, for these caregivers, people at skilled nursing facilities that were spending the night in their cars because they were scared of going home and potentially contaminating uh, or infecting uh, their community or their household. Uh, we wanted to address uh, through stipends their needs uh, to address just day-to-day -day necessities. And we have already uh, been able to distribute some 36,000 stipends uh, in that program. We have the capacity to do up to 50,000, uh, and uh, we have more people signing up every single day. But over 36,000 uh, stipends have been distributed in that program alone. And that, again, was in partnership with philanthropy. Uh, and we're very grateful the private sector stepped up and helped supported those efforts. Accordingly, uh, those individuals that were spending the night in their cars, uh, many of them no longer are because we've been able to book over 78,000 room nights, 78,000 room nights, free or deeply discounted hotel rooms uh, for our caregivers, uh, for our frontline workers across the spectrum in the healthcare delivery system. We're very proud of that. Uh, thousands and thousands of individuals uh, being able to take a shower, uh, isolate, uh, in a room, go back to work, come back, uh, and just have a place they can call their home uh, their own uh, before they get home and, and back into their communities. And that program's really just taken off 
uh, and has really delivered uh, on uh, the promise that we promoted. Uh, I recognize we can always do more, and we're trying to do more still, but over 78,000 room nights is a wonderful start. The program uh, just started ramping up a few weeks back. We've also been pushing a series of other efforts to take care of people, particularly in our skilled nursing facilities, uh, working uh, with caregivers, uh, with our I I IHSS workers as well. Uh, we've been doing these wellness checks, not just at SNFs, but in the IHSS system. We've been able to do 173,000 wellness checks. Uh, we made some agreements uh, with some of our largest unions in the state uh, to allow additional resources uh, to provide that additional attention uh, to vulnerable Californians that are uh, in and part of the in-home supportive service program, which is really the backbone of keeping people at home so they can live in dignity and live in place so they don't have to end up in our adult facilities, our assisted living facilities in some cases, even our SNFs. And so that was a foundational principle uh, and effort, and I'm very pleased by the incredible work uh, of those teams of people all up and down the state to be able to check in on 177 thousand people. We talked about augmenting the workforce, and we had some remarkable numbers. This health corps announcement we made a number of weeks back it was all around focusing on the surge. Remember, we talked about the surge uh, and the need not just to find physical beds, alternative care sites to hospitals and the like, but enough PPE, which I'll get to in a moment, and enough personnel that we can uh, surge in to help support those alternative care sites. Uh, we had a universe that was quite large of a potential uh, uh, work uh, group. Uh, we fortunately, to this date, haven't needed them. Uh, tens of thousands of people filled out applications on the site. I mentioned a few weeks back, some of them were duplicates. Uh, some of them uh, didn't necessarily work to meet our needs. But there are hundreds and hundreds of people uh, that were hired through that health care, or rather health core effort. And I just want to acknowledge their incredible work. Uh, we primarily focused on the skilled nursing facilities. We have, just as an example, this is a modest example, but impactful example. We've been talking about these strike teams, these uh, efforts on infectious control, infection control uh, in our skilled nursing facilities. Uh, we have, through that Health Corps website, uh, been able to identify, just in Southern California, 87 individuals that just came off that site that are part of our strike teams and our surge workforce in our skilled nursing facilities in Southern California, 78 in Northern California, additional 35 that have been pre-deployed in and around the Richmond area in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, all, again, part uh, of that program of people being plugged in uh, through that Health Corps site. Uh, if we need more people, we'll access more people. Tens of thousands of people applied. Not everybody uh, fits a need or appropriately applied, but the reality is that response was overwhelming and humbling, and it may be critical moving forward uh, that we, as we begin to toggle back and make meaningful augmentations uh, to our stay-at-home order, if we do start to see some community spread and we start to see the numbers grow, uh, having the physical assets in place already and having this work group that we're still vetting uh, will provide an incredibly important resource for us uh, if that personnel uh, is needed. I, I mentioned PPE. It's always important to remind people of PPE because that's a workers' safety issue and goes deep to the spirit of May Day uh, and International Workers Day. We got to protect these frontline employees and not just provide paid sick leave and stipends and hotel rooms and make sure that we have a, a health corps that can help support the most vulnerable, uh, but also uh, make sure that uh, we have their protective gear. Uh, we are really pleased this week. I announced earlier this week we got 3.1 million uh, new surgical masks that came in from overseas. Uh, just in the last 48 hours, there's been two additional flights uh, that have made it to the state of California. Uh, on board was 5.1 million additional units of surgical masks. Uh, we were able to get 5.2, forgive me, we were able to get 5.1 million of them uh, distributed uh, just in the last uh, 24 hours. So 5.2 million came in. 5.1 million uh, went out, this in addition uh, to the 3.1 million uh, earlier in this week. So eight plus million new masks, just like that in a few days, those flights coming in, part of that larger contract uh, that we talked about. It's very encouraging. By the way, those were supposed to come in starting 
May 1st. The fact that they've already come in is a very encouraging sign. And as I said, as soon as they come in, we try to get these things out. I recognize N95s uh, are a big part of the future orders coming in. Uh, and we have responsibilities for gloves and shields and gowns and all the rest of the protective gear that is also important, not only for our essential workforce, but to broaden uh, as we begin to reopen our economy. By the way, just on that, this PPE question, we talk a lot about testing. On Monday, we'll talk about tracing and tracking and isolation, issues of quarantine. I'll update you on our contracts there uh, and our workforce efforts there and some of the technology we'll use to guide uh, those operations. But PPE is fundamental in terms of reopening our economy sooner so that we can make sure when we have new guidelines those that are coming up organically at the local level or those that we're mandating from the state level. Those guidelines always include protective gear uh, that are essential for businesses to reopen uh, and provide customers uh, the option on face coverings as providing, as well as providing workers that protection they deserve. PPE is foundational in that. It's just another reason we have to be really deliberative on how we reopen this economy. I, I know it's May Day, and on May Day every year uh, since my birth, that's a day to express yourself, which I think is a wonderful tradition in this country, uh, and people protesting the status quo, uh, which is also a wonderful point of privilege we have in the United States, and we should celebrate that, and we should thank people for expressing themselves. Uh, but that expression, obviously, this year is one of frustration and concern, and deeply understandable anxiety about the economy and the fate and future of their families uh, and this state and our nation and the world collectively we're trying to build. And so I just want folks to know we're getting very close to making really meaningful uh, augmentations to that stay at home order. Um, we are, you know, like we said weeks, uh, not months, uh, about uh, four or five days ago. Uh, I want to say many days, not weeks, as long as we continue to be prudent and thoughtful uh, in certain modifications, uh, we'll be making, uh, I think, uh, some announcements. But look, PPE is foundational in that, and we still have a lot of work to do uh, to procure even more PPE. But that's a good sign. The issue uh, as well of training becomes really important uh, in the efforts to uh, identify the needs of our workers, uh, both uh, those that are essential that need to be retrained uh, and get recalibrated in terms of opportunities within the existing workforce and change their previous job description to meet the acute needs of the moment, but also those that have been displaced. We were able to get $17.8 million out in these training grants. Uh, there are 42 workforce boards in the, just in Southern California that were beneficiary of 10 uh, million of that 17.8 million, the rest distributed uh, throughout the rest of the state of California. Uh, so those training dollars also are foundational, important uh, in these efforts. And so all of these things sort of build up the wage garnishment work that we did to make sure that any of the federal dollars that were being drawn down, uh, that you can't have those dollars uh, redistributed to a debt collector. Still have to pay child support. Uh, you still have other obligations to victims uh, if indeed you're responsible. But the garnishment was another example of an effort that uh, we hope softens the edge. The most important, though, and didn't mean to use this or as a point of emphasis, the last point, but it's an important point, most important, is the issue of unemployment insurance. Uh, 3.9 million folks since just March 12th have filed for unemployment insurance. We've been able to distribute $7.5 billion. $7.5 billion now has been distributed um, to people in need uh, with this record number uh, of unemployment. 340,000 people, we just started a couple days ago, 340,000 people have uh, have signed up for the PUA, which is the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, separate from the unemployment uh, insurance. Uh, and we are processing those as quickly as we humanly can, as quickly and humanly as possible. Um, and uh, that's really important for people to know. It's also important for people to know we waived that one-week requirement uh, on unemployment insurance where there was a delay even beginning the processing. We're still mostly in that 21-day period. Uh, for the millions of people that we're distributing money. I just want folks to know, again, uh, 1,340 people was not enough to redeploy to help the call volume and distribute uh, these uh, benefits. We added an additional 600 
uh, people just in the last number of days that are being retrained and redeployed as we speak. They're not all there yet, but they're in the process in the queue. We talked about the chatbots we put up, the new texting technology, new eligibility changes. Um, we're starting to see, I know it may not feel this way for some of you that have called and you're deeply frustrated, particularly because there's multiple lines. We're also trying to integrate uh, that process as well. Uh, but we recognize we have a lot more work to do, but I do mark with data and metrics the progress and can say this, uh, that this time last week, uh, we are now 50% greater in terms of our engagement than we were a week ago, even with the volume uh, increasing. And so it's just a sign, a good sign that we're, we're starting to, you know, we're behind but get ahead a little bit, uh, meaning uh, we're not falling back as quickly. Uh, we're sort of holding our own and pushing back against the tide of, of understandable and legitimate frustration that we have a responsibility uh, clearly to address. So that's the update on the unemployment side, the PUA side. Uh, good work in progress uh, in terms of, uh, of getting uh, support uh, to our frontline uh, workers. Uh, we can't thank you enough for the incredible work that you have done through very challenging and difficult times. Uh, I've said this on many occasions. Uh, it's not just those frontline workers that we think about in the healthcare industry, but also in the food industry, but that also includes our truckers uh, and our logistics folks, the folks that are in the meat packing plants, the folks that are in manufacturing facilities. They are also unsung heroes in this effort. And I know this may not sound like a big thing, but I thought it might be important. Um, we want to take care of our truckers at some of these truck stops up and down the, the highways. Uh, they have a hard time getting food. And so one of the things we were able to do, at least at 14 sites, we want to get more of these up. I just offer it as a point of consideration. We got these food trucks. Uh, that was not legal. Uh, we made some uh, amendments through an executive order to make that legal and appropriate. But we got these food trucks up to help support uh, our truckers. Uh, a lot of Teamsters, a lot of others independent. Uh, I just want to also acknowledge all of you for the incredible work you're doing. You're moving things around. You're keeping things open, keeping things going. Uh, all those early supply chain concerns, uh, you've substantially mitigated. And uh, I just want, you know, we can't thank you enough. Also acknowledge all your hard work as well. So this is a little different than last year. I think it was with Maria down at America River College uh, doing May Day where I tried to uh, fix some light bulbs and change some T4s or T8s. I can't remember. I didn't do a very good job uh, proving that everybody has value, everybody has worth, uh, that all of us should celebrate uh, whatever vocation you have, whatever profession you have chosen. It's a sum total of millions and millions of acts of uh, individual generosity and spirit and expertise that, that keep uh, a society together and whole and make an economy buzz. And so I just want to thank you for building our economy uh, and allowing us uh, to work hard to get through this difficult time so we can get the economic conditions back uh, where you deserve them to be. Let me briefly, before I transition and close and answer any questions, just make uh, some additional comments uh, on that. Earlier this week, we talked about new phased approach uh, to uh, getting people back to work with meaningful modifications. As you know, we made some modifications that uh, I'm not sure got a lot of attention, but deserve some attention as it relates to faith-based services, as it relates to uh, ability uh, to sell cars with conditions and uh, work to open up bike stores and uh, to continue our efforts to begin to modify uh, a reopening of, of the economy. Those have already taken shape. We talked yesterday about some expansion as it relates to outdoor activities, clarification around issues of golf and tennis and issues around rollerblading and, you know, kicking the soccer ball with your family and, uh, and others all with an eye on a public health frame uh, and public safety uh, first mindset. Uh, those will continue to update on a consistent basis, but I know you are all very, very eager uh, to hear uh, about the larger sectoral and potentially regional, not just potentially and regional, uh, changes uh, that uh, we are working very hard uh, day in and day out uh, to advance. Uh, I can only say this, 
we're getting very, very close to making uh, some announcements that I think will be very meaningful to people in retail sector, hospitality sector. Yes, that includes in that second phase restaurants. Um, again, with serious modifications, uh, we've got teams of people working not just internally but externally uh, to look at each type uh, of business within each type of industry uh, and looking at sectoral and individual uh, uh, augmentation and guidelines that will be necessary and a requirement of any meaningful uh, reopening. And yes, I'll, I'll say it again, I deeply understand uh, the rural differentiation between some of the dense urban differentiation. Uh, we hear you. We're paying attention to you. Uh, we are engaging many, many of you uh, very directly, your health directors in particular, uh, and working not just uh, individual by individual basis, city by city. We're also working with the League of Cities, uh, representing all 480 plus cities in the state, and CSAC, which is our county arm in all 58 counties. And so those conversations continue. We're processing them. I just, I, get, I want to be crystal clear know that and know that I am looking forward to answering your call and addressing your anxiety, and, 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 uh, and it's not lost on me. We're not turning our back to those concerns. Uh, we recognize the economic pain. We recognize how that manifests in health issues as well. We said this in the beginning of the week when we put out our principles and our guidelines. There's the health consequence we have to address with C-19, with COVID-19. But there's also a health consequence uh, of an economy that's ailing, a mental health consequence, not just physical health consequence. And that's why, again, we started to address some of the physical issues uh, that are manifesting because of a lot of behavioral health issues uh, by opening up scheduled surgeries again in our hospital system. And that's being phased in very, very thoughtfully um, uh, up and down this state and differently in different parts based on different conditions and different hospital systems all up and down the state. Um, but that spirit uh, of recognition, that spirit of collaboration, that spirit of partnership is, uh, is going to be advanced uh, in very public ways very, very soon. Uh, but again, we're driven by data, we're driven by health, um, and, uh, and we're driven uh, by, uh, uh, by good guidance. And, uh, and so just know uh, that uh, I'm looking forward next week uh, to be making, I think, some very constructive uh, announcements in this space. I don't want to overpromise, uh, but I, I just want to assure you uh, that uh, if we can hold the line and continue to do good work uh, and just avoid the temptation to get back and congregate with, us, with people in ways where we can see an increase in the spread, we'll get there much sooner than many people perhaps think. Let me just make this point on the basis of the data that allows me to make that point. Uh, and the data today was, uh, was slightly encouraging and at the same time uh, deadly and discouraging. And let me explain both. Uh, we reached two milestones. Number one, uh, we tragically have now lost uh, the lives of over 2,000 people in the state of California. The number of deaths in the last 24 hours were not encouraging, but were part of that bucket of discouraging and devastating to the families uh, that have been torn apart because of a loss of a loved one and the communities impacted by the loss of one's life that was integral into the quality of life. Uh, for so many. 91 people uh, lost their lives in the last 24 hours. That number yesterday was up. Today, uh, in similar vein, we're now over 2,000 people have lost their lives. Don't think this virus has disappeared. Um, just ask the family members of those uh, that have tragically lost loved ones. We also reached the second milestone, over 50,000, 50,000 cases uh, of uh, positive test results that have come back. Uh, for COVID-19, over 50,000 now. Those numbers went up again. Now, the good news is so did our testing. Over 655,000 tests now been conducted, still not close to where we need to be. But by the way, it's May 1st. I wanted to get here by May 1st, and we've been averaging over 25,000 tests every single day, just as we said we would. Uh, I say that, I'm not spiking the ball, I'm not naive. Uh, that that number can be fleeting and challenging to based on supplies and uh, based upon uh, many different factors. But yesterday was close to 30,000 tests uh, that were reported. And I just remind you that were reported in. Uh, we still believe there are many tests that are not being reported. We're doing everything we can to get 
to everybody, but there are a lot of individuals, a lot of groups that are doing testing uh, that we just need to get in the system. But that's encouraging. But the testing comes with those discouraging numbers of more positives. And I just want to remind you, deaths and positives uh, reached some very important milestones. We're not out of the woods. But the good news, I mentioned good and discouraging, uh, is our ICU numbers were flat yesterday. Our hospitalizations actually went down 2% yesterday. And then that PUI, I know I said PUA, this is all confusing, uh, and I understand that and appreciate it. The PUI number in relationship to ICUs, intensive care units and hospitalizations in the state is an important number, and that's people under investigation uh, for potential COVID. Uh, that are in the process of getting test results and the like. Uh, we saw a significant decline, 13.9% in both categories, ICUs and hospitalization yesterday in the PUI space. So flat in terms of total ICU, ICU beds, but drop in PUIs, uh, a modest decrease in hospitalization, but a nice drop in the PUI. So that's good news. Bad news, positives, deaths, good news, stable line that you have provided us the opportunity uh, to announce because of your individual behavior and the physical distancing that you have done at scale in this state. That's why I feel some confidence uh, that over the course of the next week, uh, we're going to be able to make some announcements that will give people some more confidence in the ability uh, for California to get back on its economic feet. So uh, I, no, one, no one wants to hear the word patience, so I won't use that word. I'll just reflect on the fact no one wants to hear that word. None of us want to hear it because we're all impatient and we're deeply anxious and deeply desirous uh, to start to turn the page and turn the corner with all the modifications that are required. The data is starting to give us more confidence, PPE, testing, our ability uh, to uh, begin very, very deliberative uh, modifications uh, and the progress of getting this guidance ready to deliver uh, to counties, cities, and regions all across the state. And so that's a broad stroke. Forgive me, a little long-winded, um, but broad strokes update on an important day uh, where we reflect essential and displaced workers and thank everybody out there for their hard work, their sacrifice. Uh, and again, I just want to thank in particular uh, all of the, the folks that also are not part of that list, but are more essential perhaps than any other. Those are the parents out there uh, and all the uncompensated care uh, that uh, mothers in particular do every single day. May is a special month for other reason. Uh, and uh, I've said this, can't say it enough. Uh, we owe a particular debt to all our mothers, uh, all the women out there that disproportionately are in this care economy uh, that uh, have just done heroic work so often unrecognized, undervalued, I hope no more, uh, but we cannot impress upon, I think, uh, all, all, well, all of us cannot, I think, express enough our deep gratitude uh, and respect uh, to those mothers, those parents out there that are doing double duty right now uh, with these schools being closed and all the extra work that is, uh, uh, that we're all uh, under in terms of heavy burden. So thank you as well, that group. And uh, with that, happy to answer any questions. Marisa Lagos, KQED. Hi, um, thanks, Governor. Um, I know that uh, there has been a lawsuit filed by Orange County um, against the beach close, or by some residents down there, and I wanted to see your reaction there, um, and if you have time. I'm also curious about sterilizations of masks, which you authorized in April. Um, I'm hearing in San Francisco there's some pushbacks from unions who are concerned mm -hmm. about the safety of that. Yeah, I don't, I don't know specifically about a particular issue of what San Francisco is doing. I can just tell you what we announced a few weeks ago, and thank you for prompting this. Uh, we uh, made a deal with a company called Battelle uh, to put together a sterilization unit of N95 masks. Uh, the first one went up and is operational uh, in and around Burbank in Southern California. There's a second unit uh, that's coming to Northern California that quite literally as we speak is being uh, set up. Um, and to the extent that it's been FDA certified, to the extent uh, that this technology has been around uh, in the past, uh, I can only offer this. 
one of those masks arrived that was sterilized off that line from Burbank uh, today and was presented and shared uh, with our team in our morning meeting. Uh, and it looks uh, as new as any other mask. That said, I appreciate uh, sterilization up to 20, 20 times per mask uh, is not everybody's first choice. And that's why we went out to get that large contract. And uh, we are looking forward to getting uh, many, many more of these N95 masks. I should just note, we have distributed, I don't know another state that can claim this, though I hope I'm wrong, because it would be encouraging to hear of other states distributing over 44 million N95 masks, 44 million. Uh, but we'll need multiples uh, even of that. Uh, to meet the needs as we transition uh, into the future in a post-COVID uh, world. Uh, as it relates to the lawsuit, all I can say is it doesn't surprise me, um, and, uh, and we'll see. Uh, forgive me for saying this. We'll, we'll see what happens this afternoon. Doug Sovereign, KCBS Radio. Hi, Governor. A um, couple things. First of all, obviously, you're keenly aware of the protests going on all around the state and of the lawsuits being filed, multiple lawsuits. Um, you know, these folks are calling you a tyrant and a fascist, and you're being driven by ego, not by data. Uh, can you make the case that you are, in fact, being, the decisions you're making are, in fact, being driven by data and science? And the posture we're seeing from you today, where you're being more optimistic, talking about days, not weeks, is still driven by, by that, as opposed to by the political pressure you seem possibly to be feeling today. Uh, and then second, um, you mentioned two days ago that um, there was going to be a further clarification in terms of the Bay Area this coming Monday, allowing groups of kids, 12 or fewer kids, to gather, not just in daycare, but in some additional settings. Yeah. Have you gotten that clarification? Is that okay now with the state order in terms of what the Bay Area is planning to do on Monday? Yeah, we're, uh, well, in fact, um, across the spectrum, not just in terms of those numbers, uh, our team's been working hand in glove with the six counties and one individual city. So uh, we are in line uh, and we're very pleased with that partnership and that progress. As it relates to uh, the issue of data every single day, Doug, I uh, give you the data every single day at noon. Uh, I provide information every single uh, week. We give you an update in terms of the indicators. We laid out specific indicators. We've been highlighting those indicators, drilling down more deeply on each indicator. We did one on testing and tracing and tracking and quarantine and isolation. We did one earlier this week specific to businesses and sectoral strategies, even regional strategies. Uh, and then I update you on the number of deaths every day, I update you on the number PUIs and uh, not just number of hospitalization and ICU patients and you've seen those lines becoming stable so uh, that's given us some confidence and, uh, and that's why earlier this week on Monday uh, we didn't wait to respond to others we were very proactive and said weeks not months uh, and we're well within that time period and I'm saying today with some optimism uh, that we saw a decline in the number of hospitalizations uh, we saw a significant decline in PUIs, both uh, for hospitalizations and ICUs. That's even more encouraging uh, based upon a series of other factors all around the frame of the six health indicators that we've been very public about. Uh, gives me confidence moving forward. But it also gives me uh, a point of op, uh, to well, reinforce a point of caution. And that is we can screw all that up. We can set all that back by making bad decisions. All of that works because people have done an incredible job in their physical distancing. But we change that and we see the images we saw last weekend and in concentration of thousands of people, uh, we could start to see a spread again. And so that's the only thing that will set us back. Uh, but uh, I appreciate expression. I appreciate points of view. Uh, we have that with our staff. I, I'm, I'm a, I believe in the Socratic method it means a different points of views and perspectives brought to bear in a forum of trust where people can put their uh, points of view uh, to the test and be challenged. And that's the way we conduct ourselves. And that's another way of saying what I say often, and you've heard this, um, that we're not ideological. We're open to argument. We're interested in evidence. And the evidence is bearing out uh, that we're seeing uh, some good things, but still some yellow flags of caution. And, and that's uh, what we've been bringing up on a daily basis. Angela Hart, Kaiser Health News. <clears throat> Thank you, Governor. Uh, rural parts of California are uh, thankful for, they're telling us that the state is making valiant efforts for trying to ramp up testing, um, but they're still 
really an adequate um, number in terms of sites and supplies needed for testing and really it's not looking like there's any prospects for some of those rural areas and sites so what's your message governor to those rural uh, parts of california that are still facing really extreme testing problems um, in terms of the sites and supplies um, and if you could uh, talk about how case counts have factored into the state's decision of where to locate some of those um, pop-up sites that would be really helpful too yeah so I, all i can say is what I've been saying the last uh, week, you may have heard earlier this week, uh, I announced the first of the 80 sites that we have, uh, uh, have well, committed to advancing with our partnership with OptumServe. 80 additional sites, disproportionately, not exclusively, but disproportionately focused on rural California. I mentioned a week or so ago, the first one up in Humboldt, mentioned the one up in Shasta, Sutter. Uh, you can get a sense we're trying to make sure we're doing justice to that outreach. There's specifically, just to be held to account, 42 sites that will be up, additional sites by Monday, um, and we'll substantially uh, have incorporated into our larger task force strategy uh, a, an effort to implement uh, on the need for rural Californians uh, that have been under-tested and under-resourced uh, to have those needs met. We did those maps, as you recall, of testing deserts in the state and making sure these testing sites are proximate uh, to people in and around those communities. Uh, it's another point of caution, isn't it? Your question of those that just want to turn on the light switch and go back to the way things were when some of those same communities are saying we need more tests. Well, that's exactly right. But we do need more tests. We need to get a better sense of uh, what the community spread is, because in many cases, we just don't know because there hasn't been adequate testing. And that's why this partnership with OptumServe was so important and so foundational. And, 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 and it's just one of many steps to increase testing in a very targeted and strategic way. We're also, again, focusing on inner city, um, inner cities all up and down the state of California. Uh, so that's, that's where we are. We have a testing task force. And, Angela, let me have a member of that task force reach out to you a little bit more so you get a little bit more targeted precision on those 42 uh, that may fill in the blank in terms of your question, and I'll spare everybody else going down every single city and county uh, that we have lined up. Tyler Horst, ABC 10. Thank you, Governor. Uh, today is the first of the month, and there are elected officials and organizations uh, across the state calling on you to cancel rent and mortgage payments. Um, you know, folks who are out of work are worrying about eviction and debt on the other side of this, especially if they're going to be responsible for back pay. Uh, so will you cancel rent and mortgage payments, or will you make any policy changes at the state level uh, regarding rents and mortgages? Well, as you know, we've made very substantial progress on mortgages. We were the first state to announce a partnership with the largest banks in the United States on mortgage forbearance, no impact on your credit rating, other components of that announcement, uh, including debit cards and other issues related to fees and fines. We uh, were very vocal about that and very proud uh, of that announcement and partnership. As you know, we followed up at scale with an executive order in the state of California relating to civil proceedings and criminal proceedings as it relates to evictions uh, and providing a framework of time and a little relief of the stress related to the same. We also provided clarification uh, for cities and counties that wanted to go further on some of their protections uh, for tenants. Cities like San Francisco, San Jose, LA uh, went a lot further, but they had the ability to do so with some clarification uh, based on even uh, by, based on that third executive order. So we've done a lot in this space. We'll continue to consider uh, doing more, uh, but it extends not just, it didn't expire last night, it extends into this next month, but uh, we'll continue uh, our vigilance and monitoring conditions in real time, and it's an answer to your question. Um, and that is, we're looking at not just the issues of evictions and the agreements on moratorium and forbearance related to uh, mortgages, but there were timelines, you're correct, 
uh, with many of these announcements. And we are constantly looking to update those timelines, working to extend these partnerships voluntarily. And to the extent we can't do it voluntarily, and make a determination of our legal obligations, our legal responsibilities, our legal uh, uh, thresholds uh, for subsequent and further actions. And just know in this space, uh, obviously, with so many renters and uh, uh, feeling uh, deep anxiety and stress, we're going to be very sensitive to that. But, but through May, uh, we. Uh, I think we'll have the next few weeks to really put together something if we do feel we need to do more uh, that uh, will be done uh, in council and partnership with our cities, counties, and with a lot of these organizations that we've already engaged in. Marissa Perlman, CBS 13. Hey, Governor, thanks for the, uh, taking my question. I'm here at the Capitol looking at hundreds, if not a thousand, here on the Capitol lawn, not practicing social distancing by any means. I'm also looking at both CHP officers as well as Sacramento police not intervening. At mm. what point should enforcement uh, come into play here and at what point should you get involved? Uh, that's a good question. I, if I got involved in every protest up and down the state, uh, I wouldn't be involving myself in uh, the efforts to start to make meaningful modifications to our stay-at-home order and really attend to a lot of the issues in the state. I count and defer uh, to our team at the California Highway Patrol, uh, particularly at the state capitol. Um, I don't get involved directly in permitting decisions. I think that would be an unfortunate place for a politician or elected official uh, to go. But what I care deeply about as a foundational issue, which I am uh, responsible for ultimately, is public health and public safety uh, broadly defined. I'll defer to the specifics as relates to enforcement to the commissioner of the California Highway Patrol and hope you do as well and make sure uh, they are responsive to you in terms of what you're seeing. I am not there. I'm here. As it relates to the protesters, all I ask for is this, um, and that is take care of yourself. You know, wear a face covering. Uh, do justice to uh, physical distancing. You don't want to contract this disease. I, I just mentioned 50,000 people have been tested positive, another 91 families uh, torn apart because of loss of life. 2,000 human beings have lost their life. It's uh, impacted uh, the entire state, rural, not just urban. This disease doesn't know if you're a protester, Democrat, Republican, if you support the election of one candidate or, or the outster of another. Um, it just knows one thing, uh, and that is its host, and it has remarkable ability, people with asymptomatic uh, conditions to transport uh, uh, to someone else. And so just protect yourself, protect your family, protect your kids, your, your parents, your grandparents, uh, your friends, your neighbors, people that you're protesting with. That's all I would say to them and, and thank them for their expression uh, of, uh, of free speech. It's that May Day is a foundational day for that. And, uh, but uh, I recognize that expression uh, example all across the United States at this very challenging moment as we begin uh, to toggle and begin to make adjustments and people really want to see that happen uh, sooner than later and I deeply understand that. Ben Christopher, Cal Matters. Hey, Governor, thanks again for taking the time. Um, two questions. One, cities across the state are obviously in very rough financial shape. I'm wondering, do you plan on pushing for more direct funding from the state in the ongoing budget negotiations or providing as the League of Cities has requested additional funding from federal CARES appropriation? And then also, I don't know if you saw the new poll from the Institute of Governmental Studies that found that among California voters, voters who strongly approve of the president are much less likely to be concerned about the risk of COVID infection and vice versa. So I'm wondering, kind of following up on the previous question or, um, that you answered, are, are you worried the concerns about this virus and the respect for social distancing is becoming sort of yet another partisan issue? And if so, do you think there's anything that you could do to change it at, at this point? I'm Thanks working well. overtime to, to rise above the politics, the finger pointing, the bickering back and forth. I think you've seen that. I hope folks have noticed that. Trying to do my best in that space, uh, working as cooperative as we possibly can with the administration and at all levels. Incredible work, in partnerships with the CDC and HHS, and work we're doing, their organization called ASPER, and incredible work above Fenn and FEMA, administrative representatives. So uh, we, we uh, are very, very pleased uh, by that partnership and, and the progress we've made together in this space. Uh, again, this knows no boundaries, it knows no lines. You look at some of the more conservative parts politically in the state, they have been impacted by 
uh, this virus, particularly in skilled nursing facilities. A lot of seniors lost their lives. I don't think death certificates are after you're Democrat or Republican, uh, but I can assure you, if you look at those death certificates, um, all Americans are represented uh, in, in terms of uh, that tragic loss of life, regardless of their political stripe. And so uh, we, we're, we're, we're human beings. And we're all, as Dr. King said, bound together by a web of mutuality. We're all in this together. And so I, I hope we can maintain that spirit. But, but the spirit also of uh, participatory democracy is also alive and well. I'm passionate about participatory democracy. Democracy uh, is not about just standing still and standing pat. It's also about free expression. And so I also applaud that and thank everybody for their willingness to do it. All I ask is just do it safely, do it thoughtfully, not just for yourself, but for your neighbors and for others, um, and be an example in that respect. And, uh, and, uh, and I know sometimes that's more difficult than other times, and so I would just offer that as a point of consideration. Let me be very specific with you, though, on the first part of your question. Um, we haven't been passive. We haven't been uh, just waiting for the right moment. We were one of the first. In fact, I think we were the first state to formally request uh, $1 trillion um, uh, of support to help the state, states, cities across this country and counties all across this country. We believe uh, a few weeks back in a letter that we made public uh, to Speaker Nancy Pelosi that we believe this country in the next three to four years is going to need uh, the kind of support uh, around a trillion dollars. Uh, it's significant. Uh, and wonderfully, you saw Speaker Pelosi just a few days ago um, uh, assess similarly that that's about the number that will be needed to help support states, counties, and cities that have been uh, ravaged by COVID-19. And so we have been, the answer to your question is yes, very aggressive in that space. We didn't just throw out a number, we broke it down in health and education, workforce development, uh, across the spectrum of needs and supports. As you know well, uh, I'm in the process of doing a May revise. Last year I did a May revise with a $21.4 billion budget surplus uh, we were debating. Uh, this year I'll be doing a May revise looking at tens of billions of dollars in deficit. We just went like that, billions in surplus in just weeks tens of billions in deficit. So uh, I'm going to do everything I can to work with these cities and counties, uh, but I can assure you this, we are not going to be in a position, even as a nation's fifth largest economy, uh, to provide for the needs of all the cities and the counties without federal support. And that's why the federal support uh, is the foundational framework uh, uh, that uh, we are hoping to advance uh, and successfully so uh, to help us bridge these deficits, which we anticipate not just this year, but over the course of the next few years, so we can come back stronger than ever, which I don't think we will. I know we will. Final question, Spencer Custodio, Voice of OC. Hi, Governor. Thanks for taking our question. Um, my question is one of enforcement for Orange County. Um, trying to figure out, you know, it looks like some police departments are still allowing people on the beaches, like Huntington Beach, uh, there's pictures right now. Not only is there protest, but also people on the beach. So I'm trying to figure out, you know, how the state's going to uh, approach this, especially if some of these police departments aren't um, helping enforce this. Yeah, I have confidence in local law enforcement, incredible confidence. Uh, that was a wonderful statement the Police Chiefs Association put out yesterday. The California sheriffs have been incredible. Um, we have wonderful partnerships, uh, particularly with our team here at the Office of Emergency Services, coordinating those actions and activities. It's not just an enforcement mindset. It's also an encouragement mindset in this respect. It's notifications. It's communication. It's uh, state park personnel doing the same, uniformed and non-uniformed. It's PSAs that are up. It's the signs, the signage you're seeing everywhere. It's the parking lot uh, closures in and around those areas. And, and so, uh, look, we'll see, we'll see what happens over the course of this weekend. And, and look, if, if we have the kind of weekend that I hope and expect we will, uh, where we don't see those huge crowds descend, uh, then we're going to be in a position as early as Monday, Tuesday, I hope, to make some announcements of new strategies and partnerships that we're working on in real time uh, to address uh, these large crowds. Again, the only thing, I mean it, the only thing that's going to hold us back is the spread of this virus. And the only thing that is assured to advance the spread of the virus 
is thousands of people congregating together, not practicing social distancing or physical distancing. If we can avoid that, uh, then we're going to get uh, to the other side of this with modifications a lot quicker. And I, I, I just hope people will consider that because I don't want to. I don't want to be here up here, month, two, three, four months from now, um, saying the same old things. I want to be here every week, every month, announcing new things that give people more confidence, more optimism about their future and their family's future. And, and I'm confident we'll get there. And I'm confident because I really believe. Um, in this state and its people, and uh, there are exceptions, uh, but this is a state of 40 million people, and uh, you've done a magnificent job to each and every one of you may be watching. Thank you uh, for taking care of yourself, taking care of your family, taking care of your neighbors, taking care of your communities, taking care of uh, our regions, taking care of this state, and in turn, taking care of this nation. Uh, that's patriotism. Uh, that's the American spirit, alive and well, bottom up. It's not always top down, it's bottom up. Uh, and, uh, and I know it's percolating up uh, in terms of people's anxieties and stresses, and I also want to just acknowledge that, but I also want to just acknowledge you and thank you, as always, for the incredible work you've done to flatten the curve in the state of California, get us where we're this, this close to starting to make some meaningful announcements in terms of modifications. Already this week, we've made a lot of, I think, important modifications to open things up, uh, but even more uh, in the next few weeks, uh, as long as we continue practice social distancing, physical distancing, abide by those local county stay-at-home orders, and continue to be safe uh, and to always look out uh, for one another. Take care, everybody, and have a wonderful weekend.